those who cannot attend, you can let them know if they go to www. The church, amen. We are here to to honor the life and legacy of Sister Sandra uh, Nipper, and we want to just admonish all of us to remember that there is an appointment for each of us. For it has been appointed once for all of us to die. But then after that comes the judgment. We all have an appointment with this. But after this, there is a greater promise from God. For after this comes the judgment. And that judgment, there, we can be rewarded for all the things that we have done in this life. Death is always sad because we were not created to die. Death is strange because it never was a part of God's plan. That's why we irk at the thought of it. It is not what we were supposed to do. And since God has purposed it not to be he has also purposed that Christ and all who love him shall not taste death the second time. There is a better day. I know it seems like a cliche, but it's true. God has purposed a better day for us when there will be no more grief and sorrow and sadness. All of it will have been washed away. And the one thing that I can say about Sister Nipper and say it sincerely is that I know she loved God. I know she loved God. Amen. Our Old Testament reading will be taken from Psalms 90. She was a lovely, lovely Person. The Psalms 90, and I'm going to read verse number 12. And it's an admonishment by the psalmist that we all should take note to. And in Psalms 90 and 12, it says, Teach us to number our days that we might incline our hearts unto wisdom. Relent, O Lord, how long will it be? Have compassion or love in action on your servants. Satisfy us in the morning with your unfailing love that, me we, that we may sing with joy and be glad all of our days. Make us glad for as many days as you have afflicted us for as many years as we have seen trouble. Comfort us with your love. Psalms 90. And we're going to have Old Testament reading, I mean New Testament reading by Co-Pastor Gregory uh, from John 14, verses 1 through 4. Praise the Lord. John 14, chapter, verses 1 through 4. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I wouldn't have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there you will be also. And whether I go, you know, and the way you know. God's word for God's people. Eternal and gracious God, our Father, we are truly humbled at the presence of your glory. 
We thank you, God, for this another gracious day that you have privileged us to be in. We ask, God, your forgiveness of all of our sins up to this point, that we might stand in your presence today as a clean slate forgiven by you of all of our sins and this many of our transgressions. We acknowledge today, dear Heavenly Father, that we have, we have slidden back from your guidance and your control, but we will never be able to depart from your eternal love. We ask God as you smile down upon us today to look upon the hearts and the grief that is in the hearts of the family. For someone has been taken and there's a void that nothing can fill but the love of God. We ask God that you do that which only you can do, that you can fill any empty space in our lives and fill it with joy and gladness and happiness. I ask God in Jesus' name that as we come together today to administer the homegoing of Sister Nipper, I pray that you will remember the family and the friends and those who are laboring in pain today because of her absence. But we thank you, God, that even though death may be strong, it is not the strongest. For love is stronger than death. And the love of God is stronger than the absence of our sister today. We know that many things will be missing because she is missing. But memory can always dial her up again. Memories can always make us laugh again. Because in the chip of our mind, we can always replay all the things that she did to make us smile. The thing that she did was so foolish, but yet it was so humorous. We can always dial up the times when we smiled and we laughed and we rejoiced, rejoiced together. We can dial it up at any time by memory. Death may take a lot of things, but it cannot take our ability to remember. So I ask you, God, in Jesus' name, that you help us to, in sad times, to dial up the glad times. In, in times of loneliness, help us to dial up the wonderful smile that she had and how she was so insistent on investing her life into the lives of others. Help us to remember the love that she shared Help us to remember how she was able to endure and cover within herself. When she was sad, many didn't, never knew. Because she was able to smile even though she was hurting inside. She was able to be strong uh, for others who needed her strength even when she herself needed to be strengthened. We ask God that we dial these things back and remember them and all the glowing things that she has done. And I ask you, God, in Jesus' name, as Sister Nipper has ridded herself for this day throughout her life, I pray that her legacy will be that I want to follow in the steps of my mother, of my grandmother, of my neighbor, of the friend that she was to many. I ask you, God, in Jesus' name, that we take a serious look into the in-depths of our souls. See if we can find there the love of God residing. And when this battle is over for us all, we pray that we will be able to stand before you on that day, knowing that you will welcome us home. Because I truly believe that there is a place prepared for people who are prepared to go in. Help us all to be ready for that day. This is your servant's prayer in Christ Jesus' name. I do pray and thank you. By faith, we consider it done. Amen. We will now have a crown.
another crown that will not fade away. The victor's crown. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me, and forget not all the Lord's benefits.
I'll have remarks by a friend and a family member, if so desired. Church, say amen. I just want to thank God for this lady. This lady's prayers, this lady's power, her words. It's incredible. I'm upset I didn't get a chance to see her, but I just know for some reason I see everybody standing here. We in mourning. I'm in mourning too, but I'm not I'm not mourning. I'm I'm happy. Because I know where she is. God loved her incredibly. And because he loved her incredibly, she loved God incredibly. He protected all of us. Lost my life probably twice. That lady came in the hospital. I know that my body was all. Came up out of there. Went out of stretch of my body. She took me to church and she was happy. I thought she was more happy that I survived. But she was happy because of the power of God was really showed through me. I appreciate everything this lady has done for me. I'm never sitting here sad and I'm with my family. I just hope that we're still covered. Because that was the main thing growing up that she would always tell me. She, she made sure every last one of us was anointed. And our four is to make sure that the devil didn't bother us at anything and any time. I thank you so much for being with my family. Pastor Bernie, thank you so much. Um, I know this man saw his little kid, so, you know, he was at the church the day I got out the hospital and they brought me to church, and I don't know, everybody felt like, looked at me crazy, but it wasn't that they was looking at me crazy, it was they, they really saw the power of God work through me. I'm, I'm so happy that she was able to protect and love me the way she did. Thank y'all so much for even coming. That's all I have to say. First cousin Sandra. I loved her very, very much. She made the best pound cake you could ever eat. And the third thing about my cousin Sandra, she could sing. I really don't know what to say, but I love her and I miss her. But that's my cousin. Her father and my mother, brother. Mm -hmm. So we kin kin. <laughs> she loved God. She loved her family, her children, her grandchildren. She prayed for everybody. Didn't matter how you treated her, she still had a kind word and a prayer for you. It gets hard sometimes, and I'll say, I'll say we need to all follow that example. It's hard and rough. We're here crying because we are selfish, because she's in the best place. But we selfish here crying because we're going to miss her. But like I always say, She's always a prayer way. Amen. So my family, I'm here for you guys. We in Georgia, but we always a prayer way.
scripture reading uh, for this occasion is taken from Acts, the ninth chapter, uh, beginning at verse 36. And it reads, In Joppa, there was a disciple named Tabitha, which when interpreted is Dorcas, who was always doing good and helping the poor. About that time, she became sick and died. And her body was washed and placed in an upper, upstairs room. Lydia was near Joppa. So when the disciples heard that Peter was in Lydia, they sent two men to him and urged him, please come at once. Peter went with them, and when he arrived, he was taken upstairs to the room. After the widows stood around him crying and showing him the robes and other clothing that Dorcas had made while she was still with them. I want to use for a topic uh, today, honoring the legacy of love. Honoring the legacy of love. To honor something is to celebrate or to come together or to exalt or to lift up something or someone for their accomplishment. To honor somebody simply means that they are the reason that we gather. They are the reason that we put on uh, this celebration because her life should be a celebration of the victories that she gained through Christ. She's the one who's being honored here today. A legacy is that which we leave behind. It's those things that we have invested our lives into other people's lives and they are the better off for it. They are the things that we leave behind and others say, well, this is what she did. Here's how she helped me. That's part of a legacy. Amen. And when I say a legacy that's honoring love. I am not talking about the kind of love that most people say. Because in fact, love is one of the most used and misused and misunderstood words in the English vocabulary. Love is not an English word. It is a Greek word. And in the Greek interpretation of the word love, there are four types. There is the word eteros, which is a sensual love that is to be shared between a husband and the wife. Next is the love that is called philio, from which Philadelphia gets its name. It is brotherly love. It is the kind of love that we have in fraternities. Football teams have this type of love. And then there is a the love story. This is a parental love. It is the love that parents have for their children and uh, relatives have for their extended family. This is story love. Then there is agape. Agape love is a divine love. The three loves that we talked about before are sensual, they are fleshly, and they are driven by emotions. These types of love, we will say that we love this person and when things don't go right. Somehow or another, our love seems to diminish. In America today, 52% of all marriages end in divorce, but they swore they loved each other. But when somebody lost their job, somebody got sick and didn't get well, or somebody saw somebody that they liked better than they liked their wife or their husband, all of a sudden, that type of love seems to vanish. And you'll hear people say, I fell out of love with them. That is emotional. It is based on feeling. It's based on condition and expectation. I expect you to do certain things if you want me to continue to love you. 
There are certain conditions that I lay down, and if you don't bear under those conditions, my love no longer revolves around you. But agape love is God's love. It's divine love. And in that love, we are supposed to be able to control the other three loves because the other three are necessary. But it's also necessary that we have divine love because God's love has no conditions. And the object of God's love in itself has nothing to deserve it. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He, be he loved us and we were sinners. So in us ourselves as an object of God's love, we had nothing that deserved it. God did not place conditions upon us. He'd say, I love you even when you reject Christ, I love you. There are no unrealistic expectations placed on a person's life when you are controlled by divine agape love. I don't stop loving you because you don't love me. Because my love for you has nothing to do with you. For it is an act of my will. I love you because I want to love you. There is nothing you can do to stop me from loving you because he that is born of God is born of love. And this love placed no expectations on you. I don't give so that you can give me back. This type of love will never be suppressed simply because you reject it. The love of God remains the same and even though we may not accept Christ, the love of God is still available to all of us. God does not reject us because we reject him because he is love. And when you are born again, when you say that you are a Christian or you are a follower of Christ, you are simply making a declaration that I have been born of this agape love. This type of love will love you regardless of what you do or what you don't do. And I believe that every born again believer, so says the Lord, he that is born of God is born of love, for God is love, and he that loveth not knoweth not God. I'm not talking about the love that you have for me when I please you. I'm not talking about the kind of love that you have for me as long as I make you look good. I'm not talking about that kind of love. I'm not talking about the kind of love uh, that you have for me as long as I bear under certain expectations and anticipation that you have. I'm not talking about that kind of love because that love will soon fade. How many of us in here today have experienced the expedition of love that people say they love it when things didn't go quite right? All of a sudden they don't call you anymore like they used to. They don't think about you in the term that they used to think of because you no longer bear under the conditions. I expect certain things from you in order for you to get what I got for you. You have to do something. This is emotional love. There is nothing that God wants more in his love. One thing, the purpose of love is to reveal itself to others. To show others how much you love them, not because they have anything. Not because they drive the best car or live in the best houses. Not because they have the best job, but you have made a conscious choice to love them regardless of it. This is real love. It's not guided by how I feel. It's not a roller coaster where sometimes I'm up and sometimes I'm down. Love proves itself daily and, and continuously. This is the kind of love that people talk about, but they don't have it. Many in churches today say that they love you, but they haven't been born again. So that love will fizzle out. Amen. Love always talks you up, never talk you down. Love always wants the best for you, even when you don't want the best for yourself. Love is always dependable and reliable. You can always depend upon me to love you regardless of your situation. I may not like what you've done, but the love of God will separate you from what you've done. It will still love you even though I don't like what you've done, but I'm still in love with you. These are the types of love that the church is missing today simply because they have not been born again. Christ says this, how can you say you love God whom you've never seen? 
yet you hate your brothers and sisters whom you see every day. How is it that we can say, oh, I love God, but yet and still, if you don't bear under the expectation that I have for you, somehow or another, my love for you diminishes. That is not agape love. That's one of the other three loves that is governed by your emotion. Amen. How you feel. I mean, sometimes you can get up in the morning and have an emotional roller coaster, and all of a sudden, you don't like nobody. You don't feel like you felt about nobody when you got up that morning. But when you went to bed, you loved everybody. But when our emotion runs awry, we then begin to be controlled by our flesh and not by the Spirit of God. Because if you and I are controlled by the Spirit of God, there is compassion that goes out from us that is undeniable and it delivers exactly what God's love is supposed to deliver to those who don't even deserve it. It gives you the power. To love the unlovable. It gives you the power to love those who talk you down. This is real love. And these emotions that we're going through, day after day, day after day, today you feel this way, tomorrow you feel this way, but the love of God you feel the same every day. Why? Because there is a power that transcends everything that you face in opposition to your love. Because when you decide to love somebody, there are a thousand different opposition that the devil will bring against you to test the love. The moment you decide that you are going to give your life to the Christ, there are a thousand things that the devil will put in your way to stop you from going through with it. You see, showing up in church is not being saved. Paying tithes does not mean you're saved. Singing on choirs and ushermen and doing all of these things in house that has nothing to do with salvation. For the love of God is spread abroad in my heart by the Holy Spirit. This is evidence. Jesus said, By this, the world will know that you are my disciples if you have love one for another. And again, I say unto you, the church, a new commandment I give you that you love one another as I have loved you. This is the true mark of one who are born, who's born again. One who is saved and sanctified and truly filled with the Holy Ghost and ready to wear a crown. Love. If you love not, you know not. God. This kind of love will always put you in a position where you're willing to sacrifice for the good of others. Christ did it. He loved us, so he sacrificed himself on the cross so that you and I wouldn't have to die a second death. That's love. But fleshly and emotional love is always selfish. It is always thinking about itself and what it can get for itself. And when it doesn't get what it wants, it automatically cuts off the avenue of love to you. Why? Because you are not pleasing me. Love, the love of God, has nothing to do with me being pleased. It has to do with me having the power of God to do what pleased God. To be willing to help rather than hurt. To lift up rather than to tear down. To see everybody through the eyes of God. And God sees everybody through the eyes of love. And even though you and I might say, well, they don't deserve it, neither do you. Neither did I. I just told you. That the love of God has nothing to do with the object in which it receives. The object, that's me. There is nothing in me that deserves God's love. Nothing at all. Love does not originate from people satisfying you. God is the originator of love. You and I are the recipient of that love. And how is it that we are going to show the world that we are recipients of this divine love except by loving them as God has loved us? Sister Sandra was a member of our church for several years. And when the sister said that she could sing, that she could. That she could. We was in the process of building a church and we was in the wreck and she came to us at the wreck. And she began to sing a little because she, it took a little coercion because she was kind of shy. She didn't really want to do it. But when she got into it, 
you know, she knew how to sing. She knew how to prepare your diaphragm, how to breathe. We didn't know anything about that. We just sang. And she said, you're out of breath because you didn't take in no oxygen. Amen. So she was teaching us how to sing, and we had a great choir. She even went to Jersey with us when our son got married, and she sang at the wedding, our father. Amen. She, she was not just a member because the foundation of our church is love and Christ. Amen. We loved her, and she loved us. And while she was there, she executed the office of singing and the ministry of music and anything that she could do to help the church or others, she was always willing to do it and with a big smile. Amen. Love has nothing to do with where you are geographically. Amen. It don't make no difference whether you're across the street or across the country. Love don't change. Amen. And even after she left our ministry, we still loved her. My wife and her would talk on the phone. She would stop by the church sometime when we had things. Why? Because we loved her. Amen. And she loved us. And it, it didn't make no difference. I remember all the times when we used to go down to the house when she just got a house and had us down there cutting grass and all kind of stuff. Praise the Lord. She'd be sitting on the floor. Well, Pastor, you need to slow down and, and tell me to speed up all the same time. Amen. She was just a, a, a lovely, lovely person. And God knows we hated when God moved her. But when she moved, our love had moved. We still loved her just as if she was an active member in the church. And if she had ever come back, she would have been received with the same type of love that she left with. Because love don't change. Amen. And, and that's why it, it, it kind of reminded me of, of Dorcas here in our message. You know, the name Dorcas simply means gazelle. A gazelle is something that is graceful and beautiful. It is always harmless, but it's beautiful to look at. It, it, it talks about grace, how gazelle moves and how they get around. It, it is graceful. And then the thing struck me was that Dorcas had some of the qualities that Sister Nipper had. Number one was that she had a compassionate love. A compassionate love is a love that does something. Amen. The Bible says that you are not to just love in word and tongue, but word and deeds. You know, we can talk about how much we love somebody. It's easy to say you love somebody, but the Bible says talking is not enough. Talking is not enough. There has to be action behind it because love is a word of action. Amen. Dorcas died. She got sick. And she died. They sent for Peter who was in another town a few miles away and Peter came. And when Peter came, they had Dorcas in the upstairs room dressed up. And the word said that there was widows crying and standing all around Dorcas. And they had gifts. She must have been a seamstress because she had sewn all of these different coats and things. And she had given to the widows and the poor. Amen. Dorcas didn't have a lot herself, but she had enough to share. Amen. Love always have enough to share. Love does not seek his own, but rather the good of others. She had given gifts to the poor and the widows. And they was crying and saying, these are all the things that Dorcas did for us when she was with us. These are all the things. They, she made these things for us. That's legacy. That she left. And I say to all of us today that we should expire to inspire before we expire. Amen. We should be in the business of investing our lives into the lives of others so that when we are no longer here, they can say, look what she did. 
Look what he gave me when he was here. It may not be a coat. It may not be an apron. But it might be sound counsel that you gave them. So when they face opposition, they can hear your voice ringing out. Here's what you ought to do. That's legacy. And I don't know about you all, but when I am gone from this place, I want to be able to have a legacy where somebody can say, Pastor Gregor did this, and I remember that today, and it helped me. She was compassionate to those who was poor and the widowers. The Bible says that we should always remember the poor and the orphan and the widowers. Dorcas was not an Praise the Lord. Love has to do something. Amen. Love does not seek to do for the rich, but rather those who are poor and downtrodden. You know, I, I've, I've never seen such a time as we're living in today, whereas poor people try to down poor people. Amen. Those who don't have anything but have a little will try to down those who don't have as much when both of them have nothing. Amen. And I want you to understand, some black people are notorious at that. Amen. None of us don't have anything, but yet and still, if you get a little something, you want to down those who don't have as much as you when you don't have nothing yourself. Amen. You used to live in a trailer park, and God moved you to a house. Now you want to condemn those who lived in a trailer park. And we want to ask ourselves, why are not black people getting along? It's not all about the white folks now. It's not all about them because more, more blacks are killed by blacks than whites. Because we are not operating according to the love of God. We fill the churches. But yet and still God does not fill our hearts. Amen. We come to church one way and leave the same way. We're still envious and jealous and hateful towards one another. Amen. Yet and still we say we love God. If you love God, you can't hate anybody. I don't care what color they are. You cannot hate because love never hates. Amen. It's better to pray for somebody. But we come to church time and time and time again. And yet still, we have not made any significant changes in our life that magnify the love of God in our hearts. Love is the most important thing that you and I as believers can manifest to the world. The world will know us because of the way we love one another and it proves that we love God. I'm not talking about this emotional roller coaster that we're on. I'm talking about a love that sustains you. A love that don't look for anything from anybody but always look to give. Hoping for nothing in return. I remember Sister Nipper plainly the big smile that she had. The way she was always ready to do what she could to further the things of God. She was always ready. We loved her then and we love her now. But the crown that she got today is not to be compared with the crown that's waiting. It was the Apostle Paul who said, I am now ready. To be offered up in my appointed time has drawn near. He said, but one thing I can tell you. I ran the race. I fought the fight and I won. He said, but henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness which the righteous judge shall give to me and not to me only, but to all those who love his coming. There's a crown for everyone who finished the race. There's a crown for everyone who fight the good fight of faith. There's a crown for you. There's a crown for me. But it will not be a temporary crown. It's not a crown made out of silver or things that look like silver, but it is pure gold, and it is forged in the fires of faith. For Almighty God will give to each of us for what? To honor us at that day for our accomplishment in overcoming this world. You see, my God will give to me and not to me only a crown that shall never fade away. Oh, yeah, you may be sad now, but I promise you, 
on that great getting up morning when the saints of God will stand before Almighty God, Sister Nipple will stand up in righteousness. And she'll hear the sound saying, well done. Well done, my good and faithful servant. You loved when nobody loved you. You gave when nobody would give you. You healed when you was hurt. Well done. Well done, my good and faithful servant. For there is a place that I have prepared for you, and you are prepared for it. Why? Because he who loves a lot loves God. He are compassionate to the poor, the widows, and those who are in need. He said, those are the ones who will cross the threshold of glory. I have no doubt in my mind, and I do not say this lightly. I have no doubt in my mind that Sister Nipper will cross it. I have, I have no doubt in my mind that she held on and that she fought the good fight because she won. The crown that you gave her this morning, this, this, this afternoon, it may be a victor's crown temporarily put on her head, but there is a victor's crown which shall not fade away. She won't have to worry about dying no more. Because she died to sin. She died to sin. On the cross of Calvary. There was three crosses there. There was one man who died in his sin. There was one who died to sin. And there was one who died for sin. And the one that's in the middle and the one on the right are the one that's going to cross the threshold. Will you die in sin or will you die to sin? You and I have to make a choice. In you, you going to die in it or you going to die to it. That's the choice that each of us have to make. Jesus said in John 10, 10, I came that you might have life and have it more abundantly. I came to die for you so that you wouldn't have to die the second death. I came to bear the cross for you so that you could bear my cross all your life. That's why I came. Whatever it is that God wants out of us, he puts in us. You don't have to look for anything. You just accept it by faith. That's all you have to do. Faith takes what grace and mercy gives. And the mercy of God is available to all of us. By mercy, you got up this morning. By mercy, you got up this morning. And then we might have gotten up this morning and forgot to say to God, thank you. Thank you for this day because a lot of folks went to bed last night and did not get up this morning. Hallelujah. Many are going to go to bed tonight and won't get up today. And some now they said, teach us to number our days that we might live our life wisely. Psalms 27 and 1 says, Boast not yourself of tomorrow, for you know not what tomorrow might bring. Go joy in tomorrow, because tomorrow is not promised to us. Today could be it. If you're going to make a move in the right direction, today is the day. Today is the day. This is the only time that we got. Today. After so long a time, if you will hear my voice, harden not your heart. For the day can be your day to give your life to the Lord. What greater, what greater honoring could Sister Nipper have than to know at her honoring and her home going that somebody gave their life to Christ? What greater home going than for somebody to say, yes, I want to give my life to the Lord. Hallelujah. Whenever the word of God is preached, the invitation must be given. If there is anybody here today who would like to be saved, today is your day. Is anybody here who once had their life in Christ but somehow has slidden back? Today is your day. Is there anybody here who once thought that you were saved, 
but your life does not measure up with the word of God today is your day. Today is your day. While there is time, come to the Lord. For it has been appointed unto man once to die. You and I are going to die. There's no getting by. And there's no getting around it. You see, it wouldn't be that bad if all we had to do was die. See, if that was all to it, I wouldn't be preaching this because after death, I'm done. But that's not all to it, brothers and sisters. The word of God say, and after this, the judgment. Whereas we can suffer the second death. Because death to God is, is not just dying. Death to God is when we are separated from the source of life. For if a man or a woman say that they have faith and have not works, it is dead. Even so, if a person is living and have not the spirit of God, they are dead while they live. It is the spirit of God that gives life. I know sometimes it's difficult for us to believe in things you can't see and touch. You think about this. Can you see the wind? You can't touch it. Can you see matter? Can you see energy? The words that you speak, can you see them? The words that you speak, can you see them? Think about all the things that you cannot see and touch. But you realize it's there by the evidence it gives. Think about it. The Holy Spirit is real. God is real. And even though you and I may not see it, but you will see the evidence of it when you take it by faith. Nobody has to tell you about the wind. Nobody has to tell you, about you don't see it, but you can feel it. That's evidence that it's there. Well, the love of God being shared in our hearts is evident that God is real. That love, when we do what God says by faith, when we do that, then the evidence of God becomes real enough because you and I will see the effects of what God has said in his word. You don't want to do it now. I implore you to consider. Because today could be your last day. Could be my last day. Give your life to the Lord while you have time. You'll know when you've done it. Because the love of God will come in your heart. And you will see people from God's perspective. And you will love them. And you don't have to run around saying, I'm colorblind. When you, that's a lie. That, that's a lie. When you hear people say, I'm colorblind, that's people who refuse to face the facts. But the love of God will help us to see color, but yet and still deal with everybody from God's perspective. I know black from white, from yellow, from brown. I'm not colorblind. But I have the love of God, and I could treat them all the same. I don't care what color they are. But I'm not going to lie to myself by saying I don't know black from white and, or yellow or brown. I do. But I can deal with it out of the love of God. I don't care what color they are. They are all loved by God. Today we are here to, to honor the legacy of a dear sister. And I, I truly mean that. I, I, I make no declaration that I don't believe, ever. I believe with all my heart that Sister Nip was a child of God. I, I believe that because if I didn't, I could preach around that. But I, I know her. 
And I know the love that you have. So do you all. So we're here to honor her legacy of love. But the same token, remember that this day belongs to all of us. It's not when you die. It's not when, it's where you go after you die. It's where you're going after you die. You see, quality and quantity, everybody wants to live a long life. But it's not about the quantity of days. It's about the quality of life. It's not about how long you live. It's about how well you live. That matters to God. For if you live a hundred years, that's still a short life. It's still a short life. When you compare it to eternity, a hundred years, you still won't be ready to die. Amen. I want you all to consider. Consider the legacy of this lady. Consider the love that she shared. Consider her effects on your life. Do something with it or her investment in you will have no return. Do something with the love that she affected your life with. The kind of person you saw her to be. Do something with it. Amen. Become better. And I don't care who we are. We can all get better. We can all get better. I ask God daily, please help me to get better. I'm not satisfied where I am. I can get better. When you become complacent, you become stagnant, and you stop growing. I want God to make me better. I ask him to make you better. He will. Amen. We are going to um, do the in-house committal, and the mortician will come, and we'll do the committal.